Chapter twenty five of All Along the River. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. All Along the River by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter twenty five. We'll bind you fast in silken cords. Captain Halbert was not selfish enough to plead for his personal happiness in the midst of a household shadowed by the foreboding of a great sorrow. Martin Disney's face, as he looked at his wife in those moments which too plainly marked the progress of decay, was in itself enough to put a check upon a lover's impatience. How could any man plead for his own pleasure, for the roses and sunshine of life, in the presence of that deep despair. He knows that he is doomed to lose her, thought Hulbert. Knows it, and yet tries to hope. I never saw such intense, unquestioning love. One asks oneself involuntarily about any woman. Is she worth it? And then he thought of Allegra, truthful and impulsive, strong as steel, transparent as crystal. Yes, such a woman as that was worth the whole of a man's heart, worthy that a man should live or die for her. But it seemed to him that to compare Isola with Allegra was to liken an ash sapling to an oak. He resigned himself to his disappointment, talked no more of Venice and the starlit lagoons, the summer nights on the Lido, and quoted no more of Ruskin's rhapsodies. But he came meekly, day after day, to join in the family excursion, whatever it might be. He had enough and to spare of ecclesiastical architecture and of the old masters during those summer-like mornings and afternoons. He heard more than enough of the mad Caesars and the bad Caesars, of wicked empresses and of low-born favourites, of despotism throned in the palace and murder waiting at the gate of tyranny drunken with power long abused and treason on the watch for the golden opportunity to change one profligate master for another ready to toss up for the new caesar and to accept the basest slave for master would he but open the imperial treasury wide enough to the praetorian's rapacious hands People gloat over these hoary old walls as if they would like to have lived under Caligula, said the sailor, with a touch of impatience, when Father Rodwell had been expatiating upon a little bit of moulding which decorated an imperial staircase. It would have been at least a picturesque time to have lived in, said Allegra. Existence must have been a series of pictures by Alma Tadema. Captain Hulbert was startled out of his state of placid submission by the intervention of a most unexpected ally. It was one of the hottest days there had been since they came to Rome. To cross the piazza in front of St. Peter's was like plunging into a bath of molten gold, while to enter the great basilica itself was like going into an ice-house. Father Rodwell was not with them upon this particular morning. They were a party of four, and a roomy Landau had been engaged to take them to the church of St. Paul beyond the walls, and thence to the tomb of Cecilia Metella. Isola and Allegra had made pilgrimages to the spot before to-day. It was a drive they both loved, a glimpse of the pastoral life outside the gates of the city, and a place for ever associated with the poet whose verse was written in their hearts. They dawdled over a light luncheon of macaroni and Roman wine at a café near the great cold white church, and then they drove through the sandy lanes in the heat of the afternoon, languid all of them, and Isola paler and more weary-looking than she had been for some time. Her husband watched her anxiously and wanted to go back to Rome, lest the drive should be too exhausting for her. "'No, no, I am not tired,' she answered impatiently. "'I would much rather go on. 
I want to see that grim old tower again. And then she quoted the familiar lines dreamily, with a faint pleasure in their music. Perchance she died in youth, it may be bowed with woes far heavier than the ponderous tomb that weighed upon her gentle dust. Besides, she added confusedly, I want to have a little private talk with Captain Hulbert, while Allegra is busy with her everlasting memoranda in that dirty little sketch-book which is stuffed with the pictures of the future. May I? She looked from her husband to Captain Hulbert pleadingly. The latter was first to answer. I am at your service, Mrs. Disney, ready to be interrogated, or lectured, or advised, whichever you like. I am not going to do either of the three. I am going to ask you a favour. Consider that to ask is to be obeyed. They alighted in the road by the tomb a few minutes afterwards. Allegra's notebook was out immediately, a true artist's book, crammed with every conceivable form of artistic reminiscence. "'Go and talk,' she said, waving her hand to Isola and Hulbert, and then she clambered up a bank opposite that tower of other days to get a vantage ground for her sketch. She had made a score of sketches on the same spot, but there were always new details to jot down, new effects and ideas on that vast level which frames the grandeur of Rome. Yonder the long line of the aqueduct, here the living beauty of broad-fronted oxen moving with stately paces along the dusty way, the incarnation of strength and majesty, patience and labour. "'Stay here and smoke your cigar, Martin,' said Isola, "'while Captain Hulbert and I go for a stroll.' Her husband smiled at her tenderly, cheered by her unwanted cheerfulness. His days and hours alternated between hope and despair. This was a moment of hope. "'My dearest, you are full of mystery today,' he said, "'and I am as full of curiosity. But I can wait. Consider me a statue of patience, standing by the wayside, and take your time.' She put her hand through Hulbert's arm and led him away from the other two, sauntering slowly along beside the grassy bank. "'I want to talk about your wedding,' she said, as soon as they were out of hearing. "'When are you and Allegra going to be married?' "'My dear Mrs. Disney, you know that I pledged myself to wait a year from the time of our engagement. A year from last Christmas, you must remember.' That was to be my probation. Yes, I remember, but that is all foolishness, idle romance. Allegra knows that you love her. I don't think she could know it any better after another half-year's devotion on your part. I don't think she could know it better after another half-century. I know I could never love her more than I do now. I know I shall never love her less. I believe that you are good and true, said Isola, as true and almost as good as he is, with a backward glance at her husband. If I did not believe that, I should not have thought of saying what I am going to say. I am honoured by your confidence in me. I love Allegra too well to hazard her happiness. I know she loves you, has never cared for any one else. She was heart whole till she saw you. She had no more thought of love or lovers than a child. I want you to marry her soon, Captain Hulbert, very soon, before we leave Rome. Would you not like to be married in Rome? I would like to be married in Kamchatka or Nova Zembla or the worst of those places whose very names suggest uncomfortableness. There is no dismalest corner of the earth which Allegra could not glorify and make dear. But, as you suggest, Rome is classic, Rome is medieval, Rome is Roman Catholic. It would be a new sensation for a plain man like me to be married in Rome. I suppose it could not be managed in St. Peter's. 
oh captain halbert i want you to be serious i am serious why this is a matter of life or death to me but i pleaded so hard for a june wedding and to no purpose i talked with the artfulness of the first tempter i tried to play upon her vanities as an artist all in vain tell her that i have set my heart upon seeing her married said isola in a low voice why of course you will see her married whether she is married in rome or at trelasco that is no argument but it is indeed it is tell her that if i am to be at her wedding it must be soon very soon life is so uncertain at best and although i feel well and strong sometimes to-day for instance there are other times when i think the end is nearer than even my doctor suspects and i know by his face that he does not give me a long lease of life my dear mrs disney this is morbid i am grieved to hear you talk in such a strain don't notice that don't say anything depressing to allegra i want her to go off to her venetian honeymoon very happily with not one cloud in her sky she has been so good and dear to me it would be hard if i could not rejoice in her happiness i have rejoiced in it always i shall take pleasure in it to the end of my life it is the one unclouded spot she stopped with a troubled air yes it is a happy fate to have cared for one and one only and to be loved again will you do what i ask you captain hulbert will you hurry on the wedding for my sake i would do anything difficult and unwelcome for your sake how much more will i hasten my own happiness if i can but allegra is a difficult personage as firm as rock when she has once made up her mind and she has made up her mind to stay with you till you are quite well and strong again she need not leave me for ever because she marries she can come back to me after a long honeymoon we can all meet in switzerland in august if if i go there with martin as he proposes well i will try to bend that stubborn will and you don't mind having a quiet wedding if she consents to a much earlier date mind the quieter the better for me i think a smart wedding is a preventative of matrimony that sounds like a bull i will say i think there are many wretched bachelors living in dismal chambers and preyed upon by landladies who might have been happily married but for the fear of a smart wedding we will have as quiet a wedding as you and disney can desire but i should like lost withiel to be present he is my only near relation and i don't want to cut him on the happiest day of my life why mrs disney you are trembling you have agitated yourself about this business you have talked too much for your strength let me take you back to the carriage presently yes yes the heat overcame me for a moment that's all would you mind not waiting for lord lost with you i want the marriage to be at once directly as soon as father rodwell can get it arranged and you don't know where a telegram would reach your brother indeed i do not but by speculating a few messages of inquiry i could soon find out the whereabouts of the eurydice don't wait for that there would be delay there must be delay if you have to consult any distant person's convenience we are all here you and allegra and martin and i and father rodwell would like to marry you what do you want with anybody else upon my word i think you are right allegra is a creature of impulse where principle is not at stake if i asked her to marry me six weeks hence she would parley and make terms if i ask her to marry me in a few days before we leave rome she may consent have you talked to your husband is he of your opinion i have said nothing to him but i know he would be pleased to see you and allegra bound together for life i will talk to him this afternoon 
one can get everything one wants in rome i believe from a papal dispensation down to an english solicitor if we can but rattle through some kind of marriage settlement to your husband's satisfaction we can be married on the earliest day to which my darling will consent god bless you mrs disney for your unselfish thought of other people's happiness you are not like most invalids who would let a sister languish in lifelong spinsterhood rather than lose her as a nurse god grant that your unselfishness may be recompensed by speedy recovery there will be a weight off my mind when you and allegra are married said isola gravely they walked slowly back to the spot where they had left their companions a pair of oxen with an empty cart were standing in the road below the tomb their driver lounging across the rough vehicle man and beasts motionless as marble allegra sat on a hillock opposite sketching the group she had bribed the man to draw up for a brief halt while she made her sketch the massive heads were drooping under the afternoon sun the tawny and cream-hued coats were stained with dust and purpled with the sweat of patient labour the creatures looked as gracious and as wise as if they had been gods in disguise now allegra said her brother emptying the ashes out of his pipe are you ready to go home yes i have just jotted down what will serve to remind me of those splendid beasts but i should like to have them standing there all day so that i could paint them seriously they are the finest models i have seen in rome have you two quite finished your secrets and mysteries she asked smiling at isola who was looking brighter than usual yes i have said all i have to say and have been answered as i wish to be answered i shall go home very happy that's a good hearing said disney as he helped her into the landau allegra had talked of wanting to revisit caracalla's baths a wish of which isola reminded her as they drove back to the city along the appian way whereupon captain halbert suggested that he and his sweetheart should stop to explore the ruins while disney and isola went home allegra blushed and consented always a little shy at being alone with her lover especially since he had pleaded so earnestly for a summer honeymoon mrs disney your right place in rome would be the embassy murmured halbert as he shut the carriage door you are a born diplomatist what makes my dearest look so pleased and happy this afternoon asked disney as he changed to the seat beside his wife i am glad because i think captain hulbert will persuade allegra to marry him before we leave rome i begged him to hasten their marriage that was my mystery martin that was what he and i were talking about but why wish to hasten matters dear they are very happy as it is and a year is not a long engagement too long for me martin i want to see her happy i want to see them married before before what dear love he asked tenderly before we leave rome that would be very short work we leave in a fortnight the weather will be growing too hot for you if we linger later yes but everything can be settled in less time than that ask father rodwell he knows rome so well that he can help you to arrange all details i thought that every young woman required at least six months for the preparation of her trousseau not such a girl as allegra she is always well dressed and her wardrobe is the perfection of neatness but she is not the kind of girl to make a fuss about her clothes i don't think the trousseau will create any difficulty and when she is gone what will you do without your devoted companion who will nurse you and take care of you lottchen or any other servant she answered with a kind of weary indifference it would be very hard if my bad health should stand in the way of allegra's happiness so long as you will stay with me and be kind to me martin i need no one else tears were streaming down her cheeks as she turned from him pretending to be interested in the convent walls 
on the edge of the hill below which they were driving so long as i stay with you my darling do you think business or pleasure or any claim in this world will ever take me from you any more all your hours are precious to me isola i hardly live when i am away from you wherever your doctor may send you or your own fancy may lead you i shall go with you unhesitatingly without one regret for anything i leave behind don't say these things she cried suddenly with a choking sort you are too good to me there are times when i can't bear it End of chapter 25「twenty six of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jennifer painter all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter twenty six so full content shall henceforth be my lot allegra was not inexorable there in the ruins of the imperial baths where shelley dreamed the wonder dream of his prometheus captain hulbert pleaded his cause could love resist the pleading of so fond a lover could art withstand the allurements of venice titian and tintoret the cathedral of st mark and the palace of the doges the birthplace of desdemona and of shylock the home of byron and of browning she consented to a roman marriage i cannot help wishing i could be a papist just for that one day she said lightly an anglican marriage seems so dry and cold compared with the pomp and splendours of rome dearest the plainest christian rites are enough if they but make us one i think we are that already john she answered shyly and then nestling by his side as they sat in the wide solitude of that stupendous pile she took his hand and held it in both her own looking down at it wonderingly a well-formed hand strong and muscular broadened a little by seafaring and you are to be my husband she said mine i shall speak of you to people as my own peculiar property my husband will do this or that my husband has gone out but he will be home soon home husband how strange it sounds strange and wonderful now love sweet and familiar before our honeymoon is ended they went out of the broad spaces that were once populous with the teeming life of imperial rome splendid with all that art could create of beauty and of grandeur wrapped in the glamour of their dream they walked all the way to the piazza di spagna in the same happy dream as unconscious of the ground they trod on as if they had been floating in the air they were a very cheerful party at dinner that evening father rodwell dined with them and was delighted at the idea of having to marry these happy lovers he took the arrangement of the ceremony into his own hands the english chaplain was his old friend and would let him do what he liked in his church it is to be a very quiet wedding said the colonel when the three men were smoking together in a loggia looking on the little garden of orange trees and oleanders in the grey dim beginning of night when the thin crescent moon was shining in a sky still faintly flushed with sunset heiser could not stand anything like bustle or excitement luckily we have no friends in rome there is no one belonging to us who could be aggrieved at not being invited and there is no one except los withiel on my side who has the slightest claim to be present said hulbert i am almost as well off as the flying dutchman in that respect i am not troubled with relations all the kinsfolk i have are distant and i allow them to remain so my dear disney as far as i am concerned our wedding cannot be too quiet a business it is the bride i want mark you 
not the fuss and flowers wedding breakfast and bridesmaids let us be married at half past ten and drive from the church to the railway station in time for the noonday train i have given up my dream of taking allegra round southern italy to the adriatic we shall go to florence first and spend a few days in the galleries and thence to venice where we'll have the vendetta brought to us and anchored near the arsenal ready to carry us away directly we are tired of the city of old memories father rodwell left them and went into the drawing-room where isola and her sister-in-law were sitting in the lamplight isola's hands occupied with that soft fluffy knitting which seemed to exercise a soothing influence upon her nerves allegra leaning over the table idly sketching random reminiscences of the baths the tomb the grave-eyed oxen with their great curving horns and ponderous foreheads the priest was interested in watching isola this evening he saw a marked change in the expression of her countenance a change which was perceptible to him even in her voice and manner a brightness which might mean a lightened heart or which might mean religious exaltation as she told him he wondered studying her from his place in the shadow as the lamplight shone full upon her wasted features and hectic colouring has she taken courage and confessed her sin to that loyal loving husband and is the burden lifted from her heart no he could not believe that she had lifted the veil from the sad secret of her past martin disney's unclouded brow to-night was not that of a man who had lately discovered that the wife he loved had betrayed him there might be pardon there might be peace between husband and wife after such a revelation but there could not be the serenity which marked martin disney's manner to his wife to-night such a thunderclap must leave its brand upon the man who suffered it no her secret was still locked in her impenitent heart sorry yes she had drunk the cup of remorse in all its bitterness but she knew not true penitence the christian's penitence which means self-abasement and confession and yet she seemed happier there was a look of almost holy resignation upon the pale and placid brow and in the two lustrous eyes something had happened some moral transformation which made her a new being father rodwell drew his chair nearer to her and looked at her earnestly with his cordial almost boyish smile he was a remarkably young-looking man a man upon whom long years of toil in the dark places of the earth had exercised no wasting or withering influence he had loved his work too well ever to feel the pressure of the burdens he carried his gospel had been always a cheerful gospel and he had helped to lighten sorrows never to make them heavier he was deeply interested in isola and had been watchful of all her changes of mood since their conversation in the shadow of the old roman wall he had seen her impressed by the history and traditions of the church moved by the pathos of holy lives touched almost to tears by sacred pictures and he saw in her character and disposition a natural bent towards piety exactly that receptive temperament which moves holy women to lives of self-abnegation and heroic endeavour he had lent her some of those books which he loved best and read most himself and he had talked with her of religion careful not to say too much or with too strong an emphasis and never by any word alluding to her revelation of past guilt he wanted to win her to perfect trustfulness in him to teach her to lean upon him in her helplessness until the hour should come when she would let him lead her to her husband in the self-abasement of the penitent sinner he knew that in this desire he exceeded the teaching of churchmen that another priest in his place 
might have bade her keep her sad secret to the end lie down with it in her early grave be remembered as a saint yet die knowing herself a sinner if he had thought of the husband's peace first he would have counselled silence but he thought most of this stricken soul with wings that spread themselves towards heaven held down to earth by the burden of an unpardoned sin he looked at her in the lamplight and her eyes met his with a straighter outlook than he had seen in them for a long time she looked actually happy and that look of happiness in a face on which death has set its seal has always something which suggests a life beyond the grave the excitement of this marriage question has brightened you wonderfully mrs disney he said we shall have you in high health by the wedding day i am feeling better because i am so glad isola answered naively putting her hand into allegra's i consider it positively insulting to me as a sister exclaimed allegra bending down to kiss the too transparent hand such a hand as she had seen in many a picture of dying saint in the roman galleries you are most unaffectionately rejoiced to get rid of me i have evidently been a tyrannical nurse and a dull companion and you breathe more freely at the prospect of release you have been all that is dear and good isola answered softly and i shall feel dreadfully lonely without you but it won't be for long and i shall be so comforted by the knowledge that nothing can come between you and your life's happiness the two men came in from the loggia bringing with them the cool breath of night isola went to the piano and played one of those adagios of mozart's which came just within the limit of her modest powers and which she played to perfection all her soul in the long lingering phrases the tender modulations with their suggestions of shadowy cathedral aisles and the smoke of incense in the deepening dusk of a vesper service those bits of mozart the slow movements from the sonatas an agnus dei or an ave maria from one of the masses satisfied captain hulbert's highest ideas of music he desired nothing grander or more scientific the new learning of the wagnerian school had no charm for him if you ask me about modern composers i am for verdi and guno he said for gaiety and charm give me aubert rossini and boldieu for pathos weber for everything mozart there you have the whole of my musical education the question of settlements was opened seriously between martin disney and his future brother-in-law early on the following morning hulbert wanted to settle all the money he had in the world upon allegra she is ever so much wiser than i am he said so she had better be my treasurer my property is all in stocks and shares my grandfather was fond of stock jobbing and made some very lucky investments which he settled upon my mother with strict injunctions that they should not be meddled with by her trustees my share of her fortune comes to a little over nine hundred a year i came into possession of it when i came of age and it is mine to dispose of as i like trusts expired trustees cleared off in point of fact both gone over to the majority poor old souls after having had many an anxious hour about those south american railway bonds and suez canal shares which turned up trumps after all i've telegraphed to the family lawyer for a schedule of the property and when that comes just tie it all up in as tight a knot as the law can tie and let it belong to allegra and her children after her consider me paid off martin disney laughed at the lover's impetuosity and told him that he should be allowed to bring so much and no more into settlement allegra's income was less than two hundred a year a poor little income upon which she had fancied herself rich so modest is woman's measure of independence as compared with man's 
it would be for the lawyer to decide what proportion the husband's settlements should bear to the wife's income. Father Rodwell had given Colonel Disney an introduction to a solicitor of high character, a man who had occupied an excellent position in London until damaged lungs obliged him to seek a home in the South. With this gentleman's aid, matters were soon put in train, and while the men were in the lawyer's office, the two women were choosing Allegra's wedding gown. The young lady had exhibited a rare indifference upon the great trousseau question. She was not one of those girls whose finery is all external, and who hide rags and tatters under aesthetic colouring and Raphael draperies. She was too much of an artist to endure anything unseemly in her belongings, and her everyday clothes, just as they were, might have been exhibited, like a royal trousseau, without causing any other comment than, How nice! What good taste! What exquisite needlework! The hands which painted such clever pictures were as skilful with the needle as with the brush, and Allegra had never considered that a vocation for art meant uselessness in every feminine industry. She had attended to her own wardrobe from the time she learnt plain sewing at her first school, and now, as she and Isola looked over the ample array of underlinen, the pretty cambric peignoirs, and neatly trimmed petticoats, they were both of one mind, that there was very little need of fuss or expenditure. "'I have plenty of summer frocks,' said Allegra, "'so really there is only my travelling gown to see about, that is to say, the gown I am to be married in. But you must have a real wedding gown all the same, a white satin gown, with lace and pearls,' pleaded Isola. "'When you go to dinner parties by and by, you will be expected to look like a bride.' dinner parties oh those are a long way off we are not likely to be asked to any parties while we are wandering about italy i can get a gown when i go home allegra's wedding day had dawned a glorious day a day to make one drunken with the beauty of sky and earth a day when the vetturini in the piazza di spagna sat and dreamt on their coach boxes narcotized by the sun when the reds and blues in the garments of the flower women were almost too dazzling for the eye to look upon and when every garden in the city sent forth tropical odours of roses steeped in sunlight the church in which the lovers were to be made one was a very homely temple as compared with the basilicas yonder on the hills of rome but what did that matter to Allegra this morning, as she stood before the altar and spoke the words which gave her to the man she loved? A flood of sunshine streamed upon the two figures of bride and bridegroom, and touched the almost spectral face of the bride's sister-in-law, a face which attracted as much attention as the bride's fresh bloom and happy smile. It was a face marked for death, yet beautiful in decay. The large violet eyes were luminous with the light of worlds beyond the world we know. There was something loftier than happiness in that vivid look, something akin to exaltation. The smile of the martyr at the stake, the martyr for whom heaven's miraculous intervention changes the flames of the death pile into the soft fanning of seraphic wings the martyr unconscious of earthly pains and earthly cruelties, who sees the skies opening and the glorious company of saints and angels gathered about the great white throne. Father Rodwell saw that spiritual expression in the pale, wasted face, and he told himself that a lost soul could not look out of eyes like those. If death were near as he feared, the true repentance for which he had prayed many an earnest prayer was not far off. Bride and groom were to leave Rome by the midday train. Colonel Disney was going to see the last of them at the station, but Isola and her sister-in-law were to say good-bye in the vestry 
and to part at the church door and now father rodwell's brief but fervent address had been spoken the wedding march pealed from the organ and the small wedding party went into the vestry to sign the registers isola was called upon for her signature as one of the witnesses she signed in a bold clear hand without one tremulous line her husband looking over her shoulder as she wrote that doesn't look like an invalid's autograph does it halbert he asked snatching at every token of hope unwilling to believe what his doctors and his own convictions told him expecting a miracle they had warned him that he could not keep her long they had advised him to humour her fancies to let her be present at the wedding even at the hazard of her suffering afterwards for that exertion and excitement she would suffer more perhaps physically as well as mentally if she were thwarted in her natural wish to be by allegra's side on that day all was finished neither church nor law could do anything more towards making the lovers man and wife the law might undo the bond for them in the time to come but the part of the church was done for ever in the eye of the church their union was indissoluble isola clung with her arms round the bride's neck think of me sometimes dearest in the years to come think that i loved you fondly be sure that i was grateful for all your goodness to me she said tearfully my own love i shall think of you every day till we meet again and if we never meet again on earth will you remember me kindly isa how can you cried allegra silencing the pale lips with kisses you may be glad to think how much you did towards making my life happy happier than it ought to have been isola went on in a low voice dearest i am more glad of your marriage than words can say and allegra love him with all your heart and never let your lives be parted remember dearest never never let anything upon this earth part you from him her voice was choked with sobs and then came a worse fit of coughing than she had suffered for some time a fit which left her exhausted and speechless her husband looked at her in an agony of apprehension let me take you home isa he said you'll be better at home lying down by your sunny window this vestry is horribly cold halbert if you and allegra will excuse me i won't see you off at the station father rodwell will go with you perhaps he'll be of more use than i could be and we shall see each other very soon again in switzerland please god yes yes there is no need for you to go halbert answered grasping his hand distressed for another man's pain in the midst of his own happiness their death and the end of all joy here the new life with its promises of gladness just opening before him such contrasts must needs seem hard they all went to the church door where the carriages were waiting only a few idlers loitered about the pavement faintly interested in so shabby a wedding a poor array of one landau and one broom the broom to take the travellers to the station where their luggage had been sent by another conveyance the two women kissed each other once more before allegra stepped into the carriage isola too weak for speech and able only to clasp the hands that had waited on her in so many a weary hour the clever hands the gentle hands to which womanly instinct and womanly love had given all the skilfulness of a trained nurse disney lifted his wife into the landau father rodwell helping him full of sympathy you'll dine with us to-night i hope said the colonel we shall be very low if we are left to ourselves i have an engagement for this evening but yes i'll get myself excused and spend the evening with you if you really want me indeed we do answered disney heartily but isola was dumb her eyes were fixed upon the distant point 
at which the broom had disappeared round a corner on its way to the station. End of chapter 26「Chapter twenty seven of All Along the River. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. All Along the River by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter twenty seven. Gone Deeper Than All Plummets Sound. Church bells are always ringing in that city of many churches, and there were bells ringing solemnly and slowly as Isola walked feebly up the two flights of stairs that led to Colonel Disney's lodging. She walked even more slowly than usual, and her husband could hear her labouring breath as she went up, step by step, leaning on the banister rail. He had offered her his arm, but she had repulsed him, almost rudely, at the bottom of the stairs. They went into the drawing-room, which was bright with flowers in a sunlit dusk, the sun streaming in through the narrow opening between the Venetian shutters, which had been drawn together, but not fastened. All was very still in the quiet house, so still that they could hear the splash of the fountain in the piazza, and the faint rustling of the limes in the garden. Husband and wife stood facing each other, he anxious and alarmed, she deadly pale, and with gleaming eyes. Well, she is gone. She is Mrs. Hulbert now, and she belongs to him, and not to us any more, said Disney, talking at random, watching his wife's face in nervous apprehension of he knew not what. We shall miss her sadly. "'Aren't you sorry she has married Isola, after all?' "'Sorry? No! I am glad, glad with all my heart. I have waited for that.' And then, before he was aware, she had flung herself at his feet, and was kneeling there, with her head hanging down, her hands clasped, a very Magdalen. "'I waited till they were married.' so that you should not refuse to let her marry his brother waited to tell you what i ought to have told you at once when you came home from india my only hope of pardon or of peace was to have told you then to have left you for ever then never to have dared to clasp your hand never to have dared to call myself your wife never to have become the mother of your child all my life since that day has been one long lie and nothing that I have suffered, not all my agonies of remorse, can atone for that lie, unless God and you will accept my confession and my atonement to-day. It's Zola! For God's sake, stop! Again the racking cough seized her, and she sank speechless at his feet. He lifted her in his arms, and carried her to the sofa, and flung open the shutters, and let the light and air stream in upon her as she lay prostrate and exhausted, wiping her white lips with a blood-stained handkerchief. He looked at her in a kind of horrified compassion. He thought that she was raving, that the excitement of the morning had culminated in fever and delirium. He was going to ring for help, meaning to send instantly for her doctor, when she stopped him, laying her thin cold hand upon his arm and holding him by her side sit down by me martin don't stop me i must tell you all the truth her words came slowly in gasps then with a great effort she gathered up the poor remnant of her strength and went on in a low tremulous voice yet with the tone of one whose resolve was strong as death itself there was a time when I thought I could never tell you, that I must go down to my grave with my sin unrevealed, and that you would never know how worthless a woman you had loved and cherished. Then, 
on my knees before my god i vowed that i would tell you all at the last when i was dying and death is not far off now martin i have delayed too long too long there is scarcely any atonement in my confession now i have cheated you out of your love he looked at her horror-stricken their two faces close to each other as he bent over her pillow no this was no delirium there was a terrible reality in her words the eyes looking up at him were not bright with fever but with the steady resolute soul within the soul panting for freedom from sin you have cheated me out of my love he repeated slowly does that mean that you lied to me that night in london that you perjured yourself calling god to witness that you were pure and true i was true to you then martin my sin had been repented of i was your loving loyal wife without one thought but of you loving loyal he cried with passionate scorn you have deceived and dishonoured me you have made your name a byword a jest for such a man as van sittart crowther and for how many more you had lied and lied and lied to me by every look by every word that made you seem a virtuous woman and a faithful wife my god what misery martin have pity pity yes i pity the woman in the streets am i to pity you as i pity them you whom i worshipped whom i thought as pure as the angels wearing nothing of earth but your frail loveliness which to me always seemed more of spirit than of clay and you were false all the time false as hell the toy of the first idle profligate whom chance flung into your path it was lost with ill that man was right he would hardly have dared to talk to you as he did if he had not been certain of his facts lost withiel was your lover martin have pity she repeated with her hands clasped before her face pity don't i tell you that i pity you pity you whom i used to revere great god can you guess what pain it is to change respect for the creature one loves into pity i told you that i would never hurt you that i would never bring shame upon you isola you have no unkindness to fear from me but you have broken my heart you have slain my faith in man and woman i could have staked my life on your purity i could have killed the man who slandered you and you swore a false oath you called upon heaven to witness a lie i was a miserable creature martin i could not bear to lose your love if death had been my only penalty i could have borne it but not the loss of your love and your sister and her husband they were as ready with their lies as you were he exclaimed bitterly don't blame gwendolen i telegraphed to her imploring her to stand by me to say that i was in london with her and you are not in london no except to pass through when when i had escaped from him and was on my way home escaped my god what villainy must have been used against you so young so helpless tell me all without reserve as freely as you want to be forgiven i was not utterly wicked martin i did not sin deliberately i did not know what i was doing when i wrecked my life and destroyed my peace of mind for ever i never meant to forget you or to be false to you but i was so lonely so lonely the days were so dreary and so long even the short autumn days seemed long and the evenings were so melancholy without you and he came into my life suddenly like a prince in a fairy tale 
and at first I thought very little about him. He was nothing more to me than any one else in Trelasco. And then somehow we were always meeting by accident, in the lanes, or by the sea, and he seemed to care for all the things I cared for. The books I loved were his favourites. For a long time we talked of nothing but his travels, and of my favourite books. There was not a word spoken between us that you or any one else could blame. A common opening, said Martin Disney, with scathing contempt. One of the seducer's favourite leads. And then, one evening in the twilight, he told me that he loved me. I was very angry, and I let him see that I was angry, and I did all I could to avoid him after that evening. I refused to go to the ball at Lostwithiel, knowing that I must meet him there. But they all persuaded me. Mrs. Crowther, Mrs. Bainham, Tabitha, they were all bent upon making me go. And I went. Oh, God! if i had but stood firm against their foolish persuasion if i had but been true to myself but my own heart fought against me i wanted to see him again if only for the last time he had talked about starting for a long cruise to the mediterranean his yacht was ready to sail at an hour's notice you went and you are lost yes lost irretrievably lost it is all one long wild dream when i look back upon it he implored me to go away with him but i told him no 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 not for worlds nothing should ever make me false to my husband nothing i swore it swore an oath which i had not the strength to keep oh it was cruel heartless treacherous the thing he did after that. When I was going away from the dance, he was there at my side, and he put me into the wrong carriage, his own carriage, and when I had been driven a little way from the hotel, the carriage stopped, and he got in. I thought that he was driving me home. I asked him how he could be so cruel as to be with me, in his own carriage, at the risk of my reputation but he stopped me, shut my lips with his fatal kiss. Oh, Martin, how can I tell these things? The horse went almost at a gallop. I thought we should be killed. I was half fainting when the carriage stopped at last, after rattling up and down hill, and he lifted me out, and I felt the cold night air on my face, the salt spray from the sea. I tried to ask him where I was, whether this was home, but the words died on my lips, and I knew no more, knew no more till I woke from that dead, dull swoon, in the cabin of the Vendetta, and heard the sailors calling out to each other, and saw Lost Withiel sitting by my side, and then, and then, it was all one long dream, a dream of days and nights, and rain, and tempest. I thought the boat was going down in that dreadful night in the Bay of Biscay. Would to God that she had gone down, and hidden me and my sin for ever. But she lived through the storm, and in the morning she was anchored near Arcachon, and Lost Withiel went on shore, and sent a woman in a boat to bring me clothes and to attend upon me and I contrived to go on shore with the woman when she went back in the boat that had brought her, and I borrowed some money on my ring at a jeweller's in Arcachon, and I left by the first train for Paris, and went on from Paris to London, and never stopped to rest anywhere till I got home. May God bring me face to face with that ruffian who imposed upon your helplessness, cried Martin Disney. No, no, Martin, he was not a ruffian. He betrayed me, but I loved him. He knew that I loved him. I was as great a sinner as he. I was his before he stole me from my home. His in mind and in spirit. It was our unhappy fate to love each other. And I forgave him, Martin. I forgave him on that night of tempest, 
when I thought we were going to die together. You don't expect me to forgive him, do you? You don't expect me to forgive the seducer who has ruined your life and mine? His brother is your sister's husband, Martin. I am sorry for it. Oh, John Hulbert is good. He is frank and true. He is not like the other. But, oh, Martin, pity lost with ill and his sin, as you pity me and my sin. It is past and done. I was mad when I cared for him, a creature under a spell. You won my heart back to you by your goodness. You made me more than ever your own. All that he had ever been to me, all that I had ever thought or felt about him, was blotted out as if I had never seen his face. Nothing remained but my love for you and my guilty conscience, the aching misery of knowing that I was unworthy of you. He took her hand and pressed it gently in silence. Then, after a long pause, when she had dried the tears from her streaming eyes and was lying faint and white and still, caring very little what became of her poor remnant of life, he said softly, I forgive you, Isola, as I pray God to forgive you. I have spent some happy years with you, not knowing. If it was a delusion, it was very sweet while it lasted. It was not a delusion, she cried, putting her arms round his neck in a sudden rapture at being pardoned. My love was real. The door opened softly, and the kindly face of the Anglican priest looked in. I have seen the lovers on their way to Florence, he said, and have come to ask how Mrs. Disney is after her fatiguing morning. I am happier than I have been for a long time, answered Isola, holding out her hand to him. I am prepared for the end. Let it come when it may. He knew what she meant, and that the sinner had confessed her sin. Come out for a stroll with me, Disney, he said, and leave your wife to rest for a little while. I am afraid she'll miss her kind nurse. Disney started up confusedly, like a sleeper awakened, and looked at his watch. I believe I have a substitute ready to replace Allegra by this time, he said, ringing the bell. Has the person from England arrived? he asked the servant. Yes, sir, she came a quarter of an hour ago. Ask her to come here at once. Oh, Martin, you have not sent for a hospital nurse, I hope, cried Isola excitedly. Indeed, I am not so bad as that. I want very little help. I could not bear to have a stranger about me. This is not a stranger, Isola. There came a modest knock at the door as he spoke. Come in, he said and a familiar figure in a grey merino gown and smart white cap with pink ribbons entered quietly and came to the sofa where Isola was lying. "'Tabitha!' she cried. "'Don't say you're sorry to see an old face again, Mrs. Disney. I told Mr. Martin that if you should ever be ill and want nursing, I'd come to nurse you, if you were at the other end of the world.' and Mr. Martin wrote and told me you wanted an old servant's care and experience to get you over your illness, and here I am. I've come every inch of the way without stopping, except at the buffets, and all I can say is Rome is a long way from everywhere, and the country I've come through isn't to be compared with Cornwall. She ran on breathlessly as she seated herself by that reclining figure with the waxen face. It may be that she talked to hide the shock she had experienced on seeing the altered looks of the young mistress whose roof she had left in the hour of shame. She had left her, refusing to hold commune with one who had sinned so deeply. The faithful servant had taken leave of her mistress in words that had eaten into Isola's heart, as if they had been written there with a corrosive acid. "'I am very sorry for you, Mrs. Disney,' she said. You are young and pretty, and you are very much to be pitied, and God knows I have loved you as if you were my own flesh and blood, 
but I won't stay under the roof of a wife who has brought shame upon herself and has dishonoured the best of husbands. Isola had denied nothing, had acknowledged nothing, and had let Tabitha go. And now they met again for the first time after that miserable parting, and the servant's eyes were full of pitying tears, and the servant's lips spoke only gentlest words. What a virtue there must be in death, when so much is forgiven to the dying. Martin Disney went out with the priest, but at the corner of the piazza he stopped abruptly. Isola's coughing fit has upset me more than it has her, he said. I am not fit company for any one, so I think I'll go for a tramp somewhere, and meet you later at dinner, when I've recovered my spirits a little. Arrivederci, said the priest, grasping his hand. I felicitate you upon this day's union, a happy one, or I am no judge of men and women. I don't know, Disney answered gloomily. The woman is true as steel. The man comes of a bad stock. You know what the scripture says about the tree and the fruit? There never was a race yet that was altogether bad, said the priest. Virtues may descend from remote ancestors as well as vices. I think you told me, moreover, that Captain Hulbert's mother was a good woman. She was. She was one of my mother's earliest and dearest friends. Then you should have a better opinion of her son. If ever I met a thoroughly good fellow in my life, I believe I met one the day I made Captain Hulbert's acquaintance. Pray God you may be right, said Disney with a sigh. I'm no judge of character. He turned abruptly and skirted the hill on his way to the gardens of the Villa Borghese, where he found shade and seclusion in the early afternoon. The carriages of fashionable Rome had not yet begun to drive in at the gate. The cypress avenues, the groves of immemorial ilex, the verdant lawns, where the fountains leapt sunward, were peopled only by creatures of fable, fixed in marble, fawn and dryad, hero and god. Martin Disney plunged into the shadow of one of those funereal avenues, and, while the sun blazed in almost tropical splendour upon the open lawn in the far distance, he walked as it were in the deep of night, a night whose gloom harmonized with that darker night in his despairing heart. Great God, how he had loved her, how he had looked up to her, revering even her weakness as the expression of a childlike purity. And while he had been praying for her, and dreaming of her, and longing for her, and thinking of her as the very type of womanly chastity, unapproachable by temptation, unassailable, secure in her innocence and simplicity, as Athene or Artemis, with all their armour of defence. While he had so loved and trusted her, she had flung herself into the arms of a profligate, as easily won as the lightest wanton. She had done this thing, and then she had welcomed him, with wan sweet smiles, to his dishonoured home. She had made him drink the cup of shame, a byword it might be for the whole parish, as well as for that one man who had dared to hint at evil. And yet he had forgiven her, forgiven one to whom pardon meant only a peaceful ending, forgiven as a man holds himself forgiven by an all-merciful God, as he hears words of pity and promise murmured into his ear by the priest upon the scaffold when the rope is round his neck and the drop is ready to fall. How could he withhold such pardon when he had been taught that God forgives the repentant murderer? End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of All Along the River This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. All Along the River by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter 28. Though love and life and death 
should come and go. Isola was alone in the spacious Roman drawing-room, its wide windows open to the soft, warm air. The sun was off that side of the house now, and the Venetian shutters had been pushed back, and between the heavy stone pillars of the loggia she saw the orange and magnolia trees in the garden, and the pale gold of the mimosa beyond. The sun was shining full upon the hill of gardens, that hill at whose foot Nero was buried, in secret, at dead of night, by his faithful freedman and the devoted woman who loved him to the shameful end of the shameful life. That hill whose antique groves the wicked Caesar's ghost had once made a place of terror. The wicked ghost was laid now. Modern civilization had sent Nero the way of all phantoms, and fashionable Rome made holiday on the hill of gardens. A military band was playing there this afternoon in the golden light, and the familiar melodies in Don Giovanni were wafted ever and anon in little gusts of sweetness to the loggia where the violet crimson of waxen camellias and the softer rose of oleander blossoms gave brightness and colour to the dark foliage and the cold white stone. Isola heard those far-off melodies faint in the distance, heard without heeding. The notes were beyond measure familiar, interwoven with the very fabric of her life, for those were the airs Martin Disney loved, and she had played them to him nearly every evening in their quiet, monotonous life. She heard, unheeding, for her thoughts had wandered back to the night of the ball at Lost Withiel, and all that went after it the fatal night that struck the death knell of peace and innocence. How vividly she remembered every detail, her fluttering apprehensions during the long drive on the dark road, uphill and downhill, her eagerness for the delight of the dance as an unaccustomed pleasure, a scene to which young beauty flies as the moth to the flame, her remorseful consciousness that she had done wrong in yielding to the temptation which drew her there, the longing to see Lostwithiel once more, Lostwithiel, whom she had vowed to herself never to meet again of her own free will. She had gone home that afternoon, resolved to forego the ball, to make any social sacrifice, rather than look upon that man whose burning words of love breathed in her ear before she had enough of nerve or calmness to silence him, had left her scathed and seared as if the lightning had blasted her. She had heard his avowal. There was no room now to doubt the meaning of all that had gone before, no ground now for believing in a tender, platonic admiration, lapping her round with its soft radiance, a light but not a fire. That which had burnt into her soul to-day was the fierce flame of a dishonouring love, the bold avowal of a lover who wanted to steal her from her husband and make her a sinner before her God. She knew this much, had brooded upon it all the evening, and yet she was going to a place where she must inevitably meet the tempter. She was going because it was expedient to go because her persistent refusal to be there might give rise to guesses and suspicions that would lead to a discovery of the real reason of her absence. She had often seen the subtle process, the society searchlight by which Trelasco and Foy could arrive at the innermost working of a neighbour's heart, the deepest mysteries of motive. She was going to the ball after all, fevered, anxious, full of dim forebodings, and yet with an eager expectancy, and yet with a strange, overmastering joy. How should she meet him? How could she avoid him, without ostentatious avoidance, knowing how many eyes would be quick to mark any deviation from conventional behaviour? Somehow or other she was resolved to avoid all association with him, to get her programme filled before he could ask her to dance, or to refuse in any case if he asked her. He would scarcely venture to approach her after what had been said in the lane, 
when her indignation had been plainly expressed with angry tears no he would hardly dare and so in a vague bewilderment at finding she was at her journey's end she saw the lights of the little town close upon her and in the next few minutes her carriage was moving slowly in the rank of carriages setting down their freight at the door of the inn vaguely as in a dream she saw the lights and the flowers the satin gowns and the diamonds the scarlet and white upon the walls brush and vizard vizard and brush he was not there she looked along the crowd and that tall figure and that dark head were absent she ought to have been glad at this respite and yet her heart grew heavy as lead later he was there and she was waltzing with him at the last moment when he was standing before her cool self-possessed as it were unconscious of that burning past she had no more power to refuse to be his partner than the bird has to escape from the snake she had given him her hand and they were moving slowly softly to the music of the soft slow waltz myosotis myosotis mystic flower which means everlasting remembrance would she ever forget this night their last meeting safest possible meeting place here in the shine of the lamps in the sight of the multitude here she could so easily hold him at a distance here she might speak to him lightly as if she too were unconscious of the past here she was safe against his madness and her own weak unstable heart which fluttered at his smallest word and so the night wore on and she danced with him more times than she could count forgetting or pretending to forget other engagements going through an occasional waltz with another partner just for propriety's sake and hardly knowing who that partner was knowing so well that there was some one else standing against the wall watching her every movement with the love light in his eyes then came the period after supper when they sat in the ante-room and let the dances go by hearing the music of waltzes which they were to have danced together hearing and heeding not and then came a sudden scare at the thought of the hour was it late late very late the discovery fluttered and unnerved her and she was scarcely able to collect her thoughts as he handed her into the carriage and shut the door surely it was a grey horse that brought me she exclaimed and in the next minute she recognised lostwithiel's broom the same carriage in which she had been driven home through the rain upon that unforgotten night when his house sheltered her when she saw his face for the first time yes it was his carriage she knew the colour of the lining the little brass clock the reading lamp the black panther rug she pulled at the check string but without effect the carriage drove on slowly but steadily to the end of the town she let down the window and called to the coachman there was only one man on the box and he took no notice of her call yes he had heard perhaps for he drew up his horse suddenly by the roadside a little way beyond the town a man opened the door and sprang in breathless after running it was lost with ill you put me into your carriage she cried distractedly how could you make such a mistake pray tell him to go back to the inn directly they were driving along the country road at a rapid pace and he had seated himself by her side clasping her hand he pulled up the window nearest her and prevented her calling to the coachman why should you go back you will be home sooner with my horse than with the screw that brought you but the fly will be waiting for me the man will wonder let him wonder he won't wait very long you may be assured he will guess what has happened in the confusion of carriages you took the wrong one isola i am going to leave cornwall to-night 
to leave England, perhaps never to return. Give me the last few moments of my life here. Be merciful to me. I am going away, perhaps for ever. Take me home, she said. Are you really taking me home? Is this the right way? Of course it is the right way. Do you suppose I am going to drive you to London? He let down the glass suddenly and pointed into the night. Isola, do you see where we are? There's the signpost at the crossroads. There's the tower of Tower Dreath Church, though you can hardly see it in this dim light. Are you satisfied now? He had drawn up the glass again. The windows were clouded by the mist of their mingled breath. The atmosphere was faint with the odour of the faded chrysanthemums on her gown and the carnation in the lapel of his coat. All that she could see of the outer world was the blurred light of the carriage lamps. The high-spirited horse was going up and down the hills at a perilous pace. At this rate the journey could not take long. And then, and then, he came back to the prayer he had breathed in her ear more than twelve hours ago in the wintry lane. He loved her. He loved her. He loved her. Could she refuse to go away with him, having woven herself into his life, having made him madly, helplessly in love with her? Could she refuse? Had any woman the right to refuse? He appealed to her sense of honour. She had gone too far. She had granted too much already, granting him her love. She was in his arms in the dim light, in the faint, dreamlike atmosphere. He was taking possession of her weak heart by all that science of love in which he was past master. Honour, conscience, fidelity to the absent, piety, innocence, were being swept away in that lava flood of passion. Helpless, irresolute, she faltered again and again. Take me home, lost with you. Have mercy. Take me home. He stopped those tremulous lips with a kiss, the kiss that betrays. The carriage dashed down a steep hill, rattled along a street so narrow that the wheels seemed to grind against the house fronts on each side, downhill again, and then the horse was pulled up suddenly in a stony square, and the door opened, and the soft, fresh sea breeze blew among her loosened hair and upon her uncovered neck and she heard the gentle plish-plash of a boat moored against the quay at her feet. "'This is not home,' she cried piteously. "'Yes, it is home, love, our home for a little while, the home that can carry us to the other end of the world, if you will. The quay and the water and the few faint lights here and there grew dark, and she knew no more till she heard the sailors crying, Yo! Heave! Yo! And the heavy sails flapping, and the creak of the boom as it swayed in the wind, and felt the dancing motion of the boat as she cut her way through the waves, felt the strong arm that clasped her, and heard the low, fond voice that murmured in her ear, Isola! Isola! Forgive me! I could not live without you! That which came afterwards had seemed one long and lurid dream, a dream of fair weather and foul, of peril and despair, of passionate, all-conquering love. Today, as she lay supine in the afternoon silence, lying as Tabitha had left her, in a fevered sleep, the vision of that past came back upon her in all its vivid colouring almost as distinctly as it had reacted itself in her hours of delirium when she had lived that tragic chapter of her life over again and had felt the fury of the waves and breathed the chill salt air of the tempest-driven sea and had seen the moon riding high amidst the cloud chaos now appearing now vanishing as if she too were a storm-driven bark in a raging sea Oh, God, how vividly those hours came back! The awful progress 
from Ushant to Arcachon. The darkness of the brief day, the horror of the long night, the shuddering yacht with straining spars and broadside beaten by a heaving mass of water that struck her with the force of a thousand battering rams, blow after blow, each blow seeming as if the next must always be the last, the final crash and end of all things. The pretty, dainty vessel, long and narrow, rode like an eggshell on those furious waters, here a long wall of inky blackness, rising like a mountain ridge, and bearing down on the doomed ship, and beyond, as far as the eye could reach, a waste of surf, livid in the moonlight. What helpless insignificance, as of a leaf tossed on a whirlpool, when that mountainous mass took the yacht and lifted her on cyclopean shoulders, and shook her off again into the black trough of the sea, as into the depths of hell. And this not once only, nor a hundred times only, but on through that endless seeming night, on in the sickly winter dawn, and in the faint yellow gleam of a rainy noontide, on through day that seemed mixed and entangled with night, as if the beginning of creation had come round again, and the light were not yet divided from the darkness. Oh, those passionate, never-to-be-forgotten moments, when she had stood with him at the top of the companion, looking out upon those livid waters, fondly believing that each moment was to be their last, that the gates of death were opening yonder, a watery way, a gulf to which they must go down in a moment, in a little moment, in a flash, in a breath, at the next, or the next, or the next mad plunge of that hurrying bark. Yes, death was there, in front of them, inevitable, imminent, immediate, and life and sin, shame, remorse, were done with, along with the years that lay behind them, a page blotted and blurred with one passionate madness, which had changed the colour of a woman's life. She knew not how she bore up against the force of that tempest, clinging to him with her bare wet arms, held up by him, crouching against the woodwork, which shook and rattled with every blow of the battering rams. She only knew that his arms were round her, that she was safe with him, even when the leaping surf rose high above her head, wrapping her round like a mantle, blinding, drowning her in a momentary extinction. She only knew that his lips were close to her ear, and that in a momentary lull of those awful voices he murmured, We are going to die, Isola. The boat cannot live through such a storm. We shall go down to death together. And her lips turned to him with a joyful cry, Thank God! Then again, in a minute's interval, he pleaded, Forgive me, love, my stolen love. Forgive me before we die. And again, Was it a crime, Isola? If it was, I forgive you she whispered, clinging to him as the blast struck them. Cruel revulsion of feeling, bitter irony of fate, when the great grim waves, which had seemed like living monsters, hurrying down upon them with malignant fury to tear and to devour, when the awful sea began to roar with a lesser voice, and the thunder of the battering rams had a duller sound and the bows of the yacht no longer plunged straight down into the leaden-coloured pit, no longer climbed those inky ridges with such blind impetus as of a cockle-shell in a whirlpool. Bitter sense of loss and dismay when the grey, cold dawn lighted a quieter sea, and she heard the captain telling Lostwithiel that they had seen the worst of the storm, and that there was no fear now, he was going to put on more canvas, and hadn't the lady better go below, where it was warm? She needn't feel any way nervous now. They would soon be in the roadstead off Arcachon. She had not felt the chill change from night to morning. She had not felt the surf that drenched her loose, entangled hair. 
she hardly knew when or how lost with eel had wrapped her in his fur-lined coat but she found that she was so enveloped presently when she stumbled and staggered down to the cabin and flung herself face downward upon the sofa in a paroxysm of impotent despair death would have delivered her the tempest was her friend and the tempest had passed her by and left her lying there like a weed more worthless than any weed that ever the sea cast up to rot upon the barren rocks yes she was left there left in a life that sin had blighted loathsome to herself hateful to her god she locked herself in the cabin while the hurrying footsteps overhead told her that lostwithiel was working with the sailors an hour later and he was at the cabin door pleading for one kind word entreating her to let him see her were it only for a few moments to know that she was not utterly broken down by the peril she had passed through he pleaded in vain she would give no answer she would speak no word indeed in that dull agony of shame and despair it seemed to her as if a dumb devil had entered into her her parched lips seemed to have lost the power of speech she lay there staring straight before her at all the swinging things on the cedar panel the books and photographs and lamps and frivolities vibrating with every movement of the sea her hands were clenched until the nails cut into the flesh her heart was throbbing with a dull slow beat that made itself torturingly audible did god create his creatures for such agony had she been foredoomed everlastingly in that awful incomprehensible antenatal eternity foredoomed to this fallen state to this unutterable shame hours went by she knew not how again and again lostwithiel came to her door and talked and entreated heaven knows how tenderly with what deep contrition with what fond pleading for pardon but the dumb devil held her still she wrapped herself in a sullen despair not anger for anger is active hers was only a supine resistance at last she heard him come with one of the sailors and she could make out from their whispering talk that they were going to force open the door then she started up in a fury and went and flung herself against the cedar panels if you don't leave me alone in my misery i will kill myself she cried the long night was over and the sun was high it seemed as if they were sailing over a summer sea and through the scuttle port she saw a little foreign town nestling under the shelter of pine-clad hills she woke from brief and troubled slumbers to see this smiling shore and at first she fancied they must have sailed back to cornwall and that this was some unknown bay upon that rock-bound coast but the sapphire sea and the summer-like sunshine suggested a fairer clime than rugged britain while she was looking out at the crescent-shaped bay and the long line of white villas the anchor was being lowered the sea was almost as smooth as a lake and those tranquil waters had the colour and the sheen of sapphire and emerald she thought of the jasper sea the sea of the apocalypse the tideless sea beside that land of the new jerusalem where there are no more tears where there can be no more sin a city of ransomed souls redeemed from all earth's iniquity a boat was being lowered she heard the scroop of the ropes in the davits she heard footsteps on the accommodation ladder and then the dip of oars and presently the boat passed between her and the sunlit waters and she saw lost with eel sitting in the stern with the rudder lines in his hands while two sailors were bending to their oars with wind-blown hair and cheery smiling faces broad and red in the gay morning sunshine he was gone 
and she breathed more freely. There was a sense of release in his absence, and for the first time she looked round the cabin, where beautiful and luxurious things lay, thrown here and there in huddled masses of brilliant colour. A Japanese screen, a masterpiece of rainbow-hued embroidery on a sea-green ground, flung against the panelling at one end. Persian curtains wrenched from their fastenings and hanging awry, satin pillows that had drifted into a heap in one corner, signs of havoc everywhere. She stood in the midst of all this ruin, and looked at her own reflection in a Venetian glass riveted to the panelling, about the only object that had held its place through the storm. Her own reflection. Was that really herself, that ghastly image which the glass gave back to her? The reflection of a woman with livid cheeks and blanched lips, with swollen eyelids and dark rings of purple round the haggard eyes, and hair rough and tangled as Medusa's locks, and bare shoulders from which the stained satin bodice had slipped away. Her wedding gown! Could that defiled garment, the long folds of the once shining satin, draggled and dripping with sea-water, could these tawdry rags be the wedding gown she had put on in her proud and happy innocence in the old bedroom at Deenan, with mother and servants, and a useful friend or two, helping and hindering? Oh, if they could see her now, those old friends of her unclouded childhood, the mother and father who had loved and trusted her, who had never spoken of evil things in her hearing, had never thought that sin could come near her, and she had fallen like the lowest of womankind. She had forfeited her place among the virtuous and happy for ever. She, Martin Disney's wife, that good man, that brave soldier who had fought for queen and country, it was his wife who stood there in her shame, haggard and dishevelled. She flung her arms above her head and wrung her hands in a paroxysm of despair. Then, with a little cry, she plucked at the loose wild tresses as if she would have torn them from her head, and then she threw herself upon the cabin floor in her agony and grovelled there, a creature for whom death would have been a merciful release. If I could die, if I could but die, and no one know, she moaned. She lifted herself up again upon her knees, and, with one hand upon the floor, looked round the walls of the cabin, looked at a trophy of Moorish and Italian arms which decorated the panelling, searching for some sharp dagger with which she might take her hated life. And then came the thought of what must follow death, not for her, in the dim, incomprehensible eternity, but for those who loved her on earth, for those who would have to be told how she had been found, in her draggled wedding gown, stabbed by her own hand on board Lord Lostwithiel's yacht. What a story of shame and crime for newspapers to embellish, and for scandal lovers to gloat over. No, she dared not destroy herself thus. She must collect her senses, escape from her seducer, and keep the secret of her dishonour. She took off her gown, and rolled train and bodice into a bundle as small as she could make them. Then she looked about the cabin for some object with which to weight her bundle. Yes, that would do. A little brass dolphin that was used to steady the open door. That was heavy enough, perhaps. She put it into the middle of her bundle, tied a ribbon tightly round the hole, and then she opened the scuttle port and dropped her wedding garment into the sea. The keen, fresh wind, with the wind from pine-clad hills and distant snow mountains, blew in upon her bare neck and chilled her but it helped to cool the fever of her mind, and she sat down and leaned her head upon her clasped hands and tried to think what she must do to free herself from the toils in which guilty love had caught her. She must escape from the yacht. She must go back to England, somehow. 
she thought that if she were to appeal to lostwithiel's honour some spark of better feeling would prevail over that madness which had wrecked her and he would let her go he would take her back to england and facilitate her secret return to the home she had dishonoured but could she trust herself to make that appeal could she stand fast against his pleading if he implored her to stay with him to live the life that he had planned for her the life that he had painted so eloquently the dreamy beautiful life amidst earth's most romantic scenes the life of love in idleness could she resist him if he should plead it might be with tears he whom she adored her destroyer and her divinity no she must leave the yacht before he came back to her but how there were only men on board there was no woman to whose compassion she could appeal no woman to lend her clothes to cover her she saw herself once again in the venetian glass in her long trained petticoat of muslin and lace so daintily fresh when she dressed for the ball muslin and lace soddened by the sea torn to shreds where her feet had caught in the flounces as she stumbled down the companion during last night's storm a fitting costume in which to travel from arachon to london verily she opened a door leading to an inner cabin which contained bed and bath and all toilet appliances hanging against the wall there were three dressing gowns the lightest and least masculine of the three being a robe of indian camel's hair embroidered with grey silk a shapeless garment with loose sleeves and a girdle here within locked doors she made her hurried toilette with much cold water she brushed her long ragged hair with one of the humblest of the brushes she would not take so much as a few drops from the great crystal bottle of eau de cologne which was held in a silver frame suspended from the ceiling nothing of his would she touch nothing belonging to the man who wanted to pour his fortune into her lap to make his life her life his estate her estate his name her name could she but survive the ordeal of the divorce court and shake off old ties she rolled her hair into a large coil at the back of her head she put on the camel's hair dressing gown and tied the girdle round her long slim waist and having done this she looked altogether a different creature from that vision of haggard shame which she had seen just now with loathing she had a curious puritan air in her sad coloured raiment and braided hair scarcely had she finished when she heard the dip of oars and looking out in an agony of horror at the apprehension of lostwithiel's return she saw a boat laden with two big milliner's baskets and with a woman sitting in the stern the men who were rowing this boat were not of the crew of the vendetta she had not long to wonder she unlocked her door and went into the adjoining cabin while the boat came alongside and woman and baskets were hauled upon the deck three minutes afterwards the cabin boy knocked at her door and told her that there was a person from arcachon to see her a dressmaker with things that had been ordered for her she unlocked the door for the first time since she locked it at dawn and found herself face to face with a smiling young person whose black eyes and olive complexion were warm with the glow of the south golden in the eyes carnation on the plump oval cheeks this young person had the honour to bring the trousseau which monsieur had sent for madame's inspection monsieur had told her how sadly inconvenienced madame had been by the accident by which all her luggage had been left upon the quay at the moment of sailing in truth it must have been distressing for madame as it had evidently been distressing for monsieur in his profound sympathy with madame his wife in the meantime she the young person had complied with monsieur's orders and had brought all that there was of the best and most delicate and refined for madame's gracious inspection the cabin boy brought in the two baskets which the milliner opened with an air 
taking out the delicate lingerie, the soft silk and softer cashmere, peignoirs, frilled petticoats, a fluff and flutter of creamy lace and pale satin ribbons, transforming simplest garments into things of beauty. She spread out her wares, chattering all the while, and then looked at Madame for approval. Isola scarcely glanced at all the finery. She pointed to the only plain walking gown among all the delicate prettinesses, the silks and cashmeres and laces, a grey tweed tailor gown, with no adornment except a little narrow black braid. "'I will keep that,' she said, "'and one set of underlinen, the plainest. You can take all the rest of the things back to your shop. Please help me to dress as quickly as you can. I want to go on shore in the boat that takes you back. But, madame, monsieur insisted that I should bring a complete trousseau. He wished madame to supply herself with all things needful for a long cruise in the south. He was mistaken. My luggage is safe enough. I shall have it again in a few days. I only want clothes to wear for a day or two. Kindly do what I ask. Her tone was so authoritative that the milliner complied, reluctantly, and murmuring persuasive little speeches while she assisted Madame to dress. All that she had brought was of the most new, expressly arrived from Paris, from one of the most distinguished establishments in the Rue de la Paix. Fashions changed so quickly, and the present fashions were so enchanting, so original. She must be pardoned if she suggested that nothing in Madame's wardrobe could be so new or so elegant as these latest triumphs of an artistic faiseur. Madame took no heed of her eloquence, but hurried through the simple toilette, insisted upon all the finery being replaced in the two baskets, and then went upon deck with the milliner. "'I am going on shore to his lordship,' she said, with quiet authority to the captain. It was a deliberate lie, the first she had told, but not the last she would have to tell. She landed on the beach at Arcachon, penniless but with a diamond ring on her wedding finger, her engagement ring, which she knew, by a careless admission of Martin Disney's, to have cost fifty pounds. She left the milliner and went into the little town, dreading to meet Lost with Ill at every step. She found a complacent jeweller who was willing to advance twenty-five Napoleons upon the ring, and promised to return it to her on the receipt of that sum, with only a bagatelle of twenty francs for interest, since Madame would redeem her pledge almost immediately. Furnished with this money, she drove straight to the station, and waited there in the most obscure corner she could find, till the first train left for Bordeaux. At Bordeaux she had a long time to wait, still in hiding, before the express left for Paris, and then came the long, lonely journey from Bordeaux to Paris, from Paris to London, from London to Trelasco. It seemed an endless pilgrimage, a nightmare dream of dark night and wintry day, made hideous by the ceaseless throb of the engine, the perpetual odour of sulphur and smoke. She reached Trelasco somehow, and sank exhausted in Tabitha's arms. "'What day is it?' she asked faintly, looking round the familiar room, as if she had never seen it before. "'Thursday, madam. You have been away ten days,' the old servant answered coldly. It was only the next day that Tabitha told her mistress she must leave her. "'There is no need to talk about what has happened,' she said. "'I have kept your secret. "'I have let no one know that you were away. "'I packed Susan off for a holiday the morning after the ball. "'I don't believe anyone knows anything about you, "'unless you were seen yesterday on your way home.' "'Then came stern words of renunciation, "'a conscientious but rather narrow-minded woman's protest against sin.' End of chapter 28